Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. Hey there, Clever Investors. Welcome back to the Clever Investors Show. I'm Cody Sperber, the OG Clever Investor. And today in the studio, we are going back to our roots, baby. I have one of the greatest real estate investors, wholesalers, and trainers in the country, the amazing Brent Daniels, hey. who is also local to Arizona. It's about time. I know. It's about, no, it's about time that we're talking <laughs> real estate with you, okay? I'm tired of the nonsense of all this mindset stuff. Let's go back to the real we, Cody. We, we got to get to the- Let's get back to the clever investor. Yes. The glasses, the whiteboard, the, the 2005 YouTube guy. I don't even know if YouTube was around then, but you were amazing. You, you, I remember I had this buddy, Casey Block. And he said, I just learned this new thing. It's called wholesaling. And I was like, what is that? He's like, I just lock up deals and I sell it to other people. And I was like, yeah, that's just flipping. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's all about you sell the contract. And I was like, ah, I don't understand what that is. Where'd you learn that? He's like, oh, Clever Investor. And I was like, what's Clever Investor? And I tried to look up Clever Investor. It was when it was with a K. Oh right, my right? gosh. You're, you're going way I'm back. I'm going way back. I mean, yeah. he, he was in your real estate uh, group way back when you would send out leads and the yes. phones would be blowing up and people just lost their minds because they were getting deals at an event, a yep. real estate event. You like invented that. Yeah. I think. I don't know. Yeah, no, I did. Um, and, and first off, I got to give you your, your flowers because you've yeah. been in this business for 20 years, started yeah. off as an agent, became a master investor, became one of the best trainers in yeah. the world. Your podcast, Wholesaling Inc., is probably the top of the top of the top podcast when it comes to real estate wholesaling. For so sure. congrats on Thank all you. All that success. And I've watched you over the years grow your empire. Yeah. And it's been it's been remarkable. And you've helped a lot of people get into the game because real estate wholesaling yeah. is the gateway to getting into this business. Yeah. If you have limited resources, if you have uh, uh, no connections to the real estate business, maybe no mentors in your life, you've never had success, you've never ha been an entrepreneur, and you know that real estate's that vehicle. Because like for whatever reason, you've always just kind of got it, yep. right? Everybody needs a place to live. It's a future-proof business. Mm -hmm. People will always need a place to live. How do I get into this game? Is it for rich people? Do I need a license? Do I need to have all this capital and cash sitting around? Do I got to be rich right. before I invest in real estate? Right. And um, what I love about how I started, how you started, is we got into this business using our hustle, using mm -hmm. our effort, using our skills and capabilities to create deals. Yeah. And so what I wanted to do in today's episode is go back to the basics because I got Brent in town. Love it. Um, uh, and just kind of unpack what is wholesaling, how to get in if I have limited resources. Let's go through the six or seven steps to, to actually putting a deal together. Because like the, when, when you think about it, you got to, you got to learn. Yeah. That's like the first stage, yeah. right? You got to learn how this business works because we got to, we got to set our business up the right way. Mm -hmm. We got to learn how to generate some opportunities. We got to learn how to analyze a deal. Yeah. We got to learn how to make an offer and negotiate a deal and then eventually lock it up under contract. And then we got to figure out what to do with it once we have undercut. Did we get a good deal? Or how do we market it? How do we find the cash buyers that are out there that are looking for deals mm -hmm. that will buy the property from us. So let's start with the basics. Yeah. What is real estate wholesaling? Well, all of that you can boil down to just have conversations with property owners that have ugly houses. That's it. Just start there, right? Just start with having a, you have to have a conversation with a property owner that, that this property needs significant investment. From there, it's just making the offer. This is the sticking point for a lot of people that are getting started, that are interested in being real estate entrepreneurs is, well, I don't know how to, what to offer. I don't know if this is a deal or not a deal. I don't know what's going on here, right? So it's, it's just really important that you combine having conversations and making offers with squatting up with people that do this business. All right. Okay. And, and, and we'll go, we'll go all into that. But wholesaling basically is this, there's a property, there's a person that has a personal problem with a property, right? Okay. There's a lot of peas right there, but <laughs> it, it is, they have a personal problem with a property and they want to sell it. Uh, and they want speed and convenience. Price really isn't the biggest um, factor in their decision making. They want to get it sold and they want to get it sold fast. Okay. What would the cause somebody to get that motivated where they're not on price? Because if you, 
went to any normal yeah. homeowner, yeah. they're not going to sell at a big discount. They're going to get an agent. They're going to list it. They're going to make repairs. They're going to wait whatever time necessary to get uh, uh, the best offer they could. Yeah. What would cause somebody to take a discount? So there has to be some sort of problem. There has to be some sort of distress. A lot of people that inherit properties, that it was their their parents' property and it, they just don't have the, the finances to be able to fix up this property. Plus, most families, 80% liquidate all of the assets, split it with the family so that there's not any infighting and everybody gets their piece type of thing. So you've got inherited properties. You've got people that are in financial distress. They can't keep up with the property anymore because they don't have the income to do it or they just don't want to do it. They just let the properties kind of do the Amer- the average American saves less than a thousand dollars a year. And it costs five thousand a year to own a house just for upkeep. Yeah. I mean, Google it. Yeah. Google so they get average a- upkeep for a single family property in the United States. It's anywhere from three to five thousand, depending on where you're at in the country. So if they so lose their job just, or they fall behind on on their finances. Even if they have a job, even if they have a job, they can't constantly be upgrading everything. You see it all the time. Yeah. You walk into houses, there's wires going crazy. There's there's you've got smoke detectors that don't have batteries in them. You've got, you know, uh some flooding that never got fixed. So a there's little, a little, little bit of damage. Little mold damage. There's there's just wear and tear on properties. People really don't understand. Like a house is like a living organism. You have to feed this thing. You have to take care of it. You have to make sure that it uh, stays functional, right? And if like, let's say here in Arizona, it's critical to have air conditioning. Absolutely. It's critical to, uh, uh, like you have to have a stove. Mm -hmm. A lender will not lend on a property Mm -hmm. if functionally Mm -hmm. certain things are broken or missing. Sure. Right? So a conventional buyer can't even buy it if they wanted to because they can't get a loan because the roof has a a major issue or there's no AC unit working or it's missing the stove and that's broken. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that would prevent a normal buyer from buying it. Yeah, I mean, really, there's three buckets of distress with property owners. It is the the condition. The condition of the property is a distress. They just can't keep up with it. There's financial distress because of the ebb and flow of how much income they're making. And then there's emotional distress. People go through... really tough times. People have some bad situations that happen in properties that they don't want to deal with anymore. So they want to get rid of that emotion that they run into every single like time. A divorce they go to or this something. Property. A they, divorce. They don't want to uh, have those memories. Somebody passed away in the property. Uh, you know, there was a, a big major fight that happened between father and son in the front yard. Who knows? There's millions yeah. of different reasons. And we've, we've, we've done business with all of these different situations. But basically, as a investor, our our job is to buy discounted properties, okay. right? We make money. A property that is that is bought right is already half sold, right? And mm, so- Say that again. Wait, a, explain what you mean by that. A property that is bought right is already half sold because you're buy, you're getting equity walking in. You have a property that somebody could could um, could clean up a little bit and it's worth 150,000 that you get for 80,000. You know what I mean? That that's that's just finding uh, really good opportunities, and so that's that's our job. All wholesaling is is the art of finding discounted properties. That's it. So when I once I find it, because this is a big question I get asked all the time, is yeah. like Cody, you you talk about no money down. Okay, so let's say I take your training and I go find this beat up property or this this homeowner that's in a little bit of despair, and I work out a deal to buy their property, and yeah. it is a good deal, and I get it under contract. But what if I can't find a buyer? What what do I do now? Like how do I know that I'm not going to be responsible for having to pay for this? Because if I told the seller I'm buying your house yeah. for eighty k. I don't have 80K. I'm broke, bro. I live in an apartment. My bills are stacking up. My car's about to get repoed. And I saw, uh, I, I listened to a Wholesaling Inc. podcast saying I could do this. Yeah. So I went and did the first half, Yeah, but now I'm scared. Well, first first step, you need to be an actual buyer. There is something called transactional funding. Transactional funding will give you 100% of the purchase price if it's a real deal. Mm. Right? There's transactional funders throughout the whole country. Jamil just put out $20 million out into the streets for transactional funding. Everybody, everybody listening to this and watching this is now a cash buyer. The industry set up for us, Cody. You know, yep. you know, the industry is set up for us. If you go and find a great opportunity, the money is plentiful. It is all so set that up. objection or that fear of if I get a good deal right. on a contract you and can I can't close find a buyer, there's there's options to close. So we just eliminated that fear. And that's well, a- and it's real important that because a lot of people get stuck 
in their business because they of imposter syndrome. They go, I only have $17 in my account. I'm living on my buddy's couch, but I just found this great opportunity. I go and tell them that I'm going to buy their house, but I'm not a real buyer. I feel shady. I'm lying to them. And you are lying to them. So go have a conversation today with a transactional funding uh, company and say, hey, what is the process of me getting transactional funds? Boom, you're set. Or if you want to go old school, go to a meetup and go talk to the, the, the Cody Spurbers of the world that are there speaking or presenting or just there networking and say, hey, listen, if I have a really good deal, would you fund it? The answer will be yes. Mm-hmm. So now you've got the backing of a local mentor investor that's going to walk you through this whole process and you have transactional funding. So you're set. Yeah. So and, you're a real buyer and that's what's important. You can't go out there and just lie to property owners and say, hey, I'm going to buy your house and with the full intention of just selling that contract to somebody else without the means to be able to purchase it. That's the difference. Okay. So just to close this loop, wholesaling is finding distressed properties or distressed sellers, mm-hmm. property owners, working out a deal to buy their property, yep. locking it up under contract. And during the contract period, Mm -hmm. what we're going to do is turn around and shop that contract to landlords and rehabbers looking for good deals that have more money than time. We're playing matchmaker. And through that matchmaking process, we earn a fee. The the best. I just want to clarify for everybody, because sometimes when you're new and you hear this for the first time, you think, bullshit. Yeah. No way. Yeah. That can't be real. That's a scam. I go to you. You have a property. We put together a purchase contract, Yeah, right? As soon as you sign it and I sign it, that's an asset. Mm. I can sell that asset right now. That is one of three exit strategies that you have. You can assign that contract. You can buy it and flip it, or you can buy it and hold it. That's it. That's the three exit strategies. So if I have this now is an asset and I go over and I talk to these guys and I say, hey, listen, do you want to buy this? the right to purchase this property at this price and they say yes they pay me for this contract love it and and he and just for everybody listening he's pointing at a water bottle that he's pretending is a contract yeah. or a property contract it's the closest but, but thing yeah, to me yeah but i love it because i think it's really important for people to understand the asset is the contract not the property and yep. that's what you're trying to teach right now yep. when you put a property under contract in the united states you gain something called equitable interest equitable interest is your ability to do what you said you would do in the contract. Just like when you rent a property, if I'm renting your house, it's not my house, Mm -hmm. you still own it, Mm -hmm. but I have certain rights that you cannot take away from me now that I've signed a rental agreement. You can't just barge into my my rental Mm -hmm. and stomp around. You can't just rent it to somebody else. You can't rent it to somebody else. I've taken certain rights from your bundle of rights, Mm -hmm. because, and by the way, now we're getting nerdy. Mm-hmm. Title, clever title yeah. is a um, <laughs> title is ownership of a property, and what title really is, and the way you can visualize it is like a bundle of sticks. Each stick is a certain right you have in the property: the right to have, the right to burn it to the ground, the right to make money from it, yep. to rent it out. And there's all these rights that when I work out s- some form of a deal with you, I don't have to give you the whole bundle. Yeah, I could just break apart a few twigs. And hand those to you. And, and when you're whole, when you're buying property, I'm handing you almost all of the bundle initially. And until you close, I'm still holding on to the rest until you yeah. perform per the contract. Right. So as long, visually, that might help some of you analytical people trying to figure out like, but why do you have the right to flip a contract if you don't have a real estate license? Mm-hmm. So answer that question. Why don't I need a license to wholesale? Because I, well, in some states you do. Okay. In some states. Like what? Give me an example. In Illinois, you do. In Kansas, you do. In Oklahoma, you do. Um, they they require it um, to be able to to wholesale. I mean, I think you can do one and then that's it. And so I think it's really smart to get a license. I think that that you should probably have a license in every state. I think it's probably going to go there at some point, but maybe not. You know what I mean? I think it's just I think it's a uh, it's a good way of of bringing legitimacy to your business if you have a license because you, there's a, a governing body that's going to I'm make, a big fan of getting make, license make sure that there's some ethical you know yeah. there's some a code of ethics that that you follow um but yeah in most states that you don't need to because I'm not representing you 
So you have to understand as an agent, you have fiduciary duty to do what's best for the client. I represent your interest. I'm your proxy when it comes to the negotiation and the marketing of that property. That's a totally different thing. When I want when I'm a buyer, I'm going to you as a buyer. I don't I, I don't have fiduciary duty to you mm-hmm. as a buyer. That's that's agency. So that's the big difference there is um I determine and 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 let, let's just well, we can get into who determines value in a second, but yeah. basically, um, a buyer is much different than being an agent. I love that. And and when once in the beginning, uh, I was wholesaling without a license. Then I got my license, yeah. held it for a few years, realized I didn't want to be a real estate agent in the agent capacity, driving around people, showing houses, listings, all that stuff. But I loved having my license for my own personal use. Mm-hmm. When I bought my own house, I saved on commissions, those kind of things. And I was able to have agent to agent conversations mm-hmm. and they didn't treat me different. Yeah. They treated me like a peer. Yeah. Whereas if you're just a non-licensed person calling an agent, sometimes they're like, ugh, here comes another wannabe investor that's going to waste my time yeah. and not going to give me my commissions and try to try to just, you know, get me to comp properties yeah. for them or something. And so uh, now that in, in the realtor boards are, the board of realtors, so super smart. They put so much pressure on certain in certain states that they were able to get requirements changed that you yep. do need I think there might over the next 10 years be statewide where you have to have a license to do that so let's get out in front of it now yeah plus i think having accountability is good yeah right like well, i can't just market and say wild shit if i have my license and if there's a code of ethics involved uh, it just brings more legitimacy to it. It's yeah. not, it's no longer, you know, wholesaling is in the shadows, so to speak. It's more forefront. And I think that that's be- better for everybody. If it becomes common language then and people understand what's happening, then, um, then I, I think that a lot of people are going to accept it and it's just going to be part of real estate investing. Yeah. And, and it th- already is. Yeah. I was going to say, I think the tech companies did a good job pushing us forward. Yeah. Because for many years, it was kind of in the gray area. Yeah. Like people didn't understand it. They saw the We Buy Ugly Houses ads and mm-hmm. signs and the little bandit signs on the sides of roads. And they thought, oh, I don't know about this. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, a big tech company comes along like OfferPad or Open Door, and mm-hmm. they're like, three clicks and we'll buy your house. Yeah. Everybody was like being educated. Yep. So I, it probably is you know, overall a good thing for our industry. Yeah. Even though fucking hedge funds went around and bought up one fifth of every property in the United States and almost completely obliterated the middle class. Besides that, I mean, listen, (laughs) he who has the gold, (laughs) you know? Jeez, man, they bought up a lot of real estate. Yeah. And it's funny because I talk about that on some other podcasts. Like, why would they do that? They did that because they understand how money works. Yeah. They understand how inflation works. They knew that if they bought real estate with good cheap debt over a long period of time in a high inflationary period, that debt would erode. Yep. Because inflation erodes Mm -hmm. good debt Mm -hmm. over long periods of time. Well, and they double dip, right? So they've got their money in the, in the market and then they pull it out of the market in a loan of whatever it is. I mean, that's why you saw the, the hedge funds, you know, shrinking when interest rates went up because obviously their lines um, of credit, their lines of credit, you know, it, it just doesn't make as much sense if you look at the numbers, but they, they've got money in the market making money and then they get a loan on the money in the market mm-hmm. making money and they put that money into buying uh, single family houses, cash. Yeah. And then they get tenants in there. So tenants are paying them there. They've got a hedge against inflation and they've got appreciation. Man, they're, ar- they're the master arbitragers. Yeah. And that's really all real estate wholesaling is, is arbitraging yeah. all these p- parties. Because now the next step, I get it under contract. What do I do next? Mm-hmm. Well, actually, let's take one step back. Yeah. Well, no, let's start at high. I want to keep it high level. What happens after I get it under contract? So after you get it under contract, you've got an inspection period. And during that inspection period, um, you can go forward and do inspections and get your lenders in there and contracts in there, contractors in there, if you if you have the intention of actually buying it. Um, or you can put it out, put word out to all of your cash buyers, all of the investors in town and say, hey, listen, do you want to buy this contract? And so... Um, during that period, you you have the like a it's a grace period to be able to to market that that contract, and so um, during that time, you find a buyer. They decide they want to buy it. They put down their earnest money, which replaces your earnest money. We don't have to get too technical yeah. for anybody that's just getting started. Google earnest money; it's pretty simple. Uh, and uh, then you're out of the deal, 
and you have something that's called an assignment agreement that you have signed with this cash buyer. And now you've got a purchase agreement that they bought and you've got an assignment agreement that says, hey, listen, I'm going to pay you 25 grand for this property. It goes to the title company. They bring in their cash. The, the uh, owner gets the the money that they got from the purchase agreement. You get the money that's on the assignment agreement. And boom, you're getting paid. You, you're getting by paid. By playing matchmaker. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it just to, to clarify a couple things. So I have a property under contract. It's a good deal. Yep. I'm now shopping that contract around town to landlords and rehabbers. Yep. And I'm screaming. Like, I'm literally screaming. Like, guys, smoking hot deal, served up on a silver platter. Who wants this bad boy? Mm-hmm. And I'm screaming on all Facebook groups, I'm on yes. social channels. I'm maybe putting out little signs around the neighborhood saying, uh, investor special, needs repairs, call me immediately, cash only. Uh, maybe I'm I'm emailing and texting my already existing cash buyer database. Mm-hmm. What are some other things I'm missing? Like may, what I'm calling agents saying, hey, you got anybody for this thing? I'm calling other yeah. wholesalers. Yeah. I mean, if you, if, if you just want to make, simplify this all the way down, you and I could go out right now to this neighborhood behind your office. Incredible office that Cody has here. 18,000 square feet. Yes, sir. I mean, People don't understand how much of a real estate investor you really are. We talked about this before yeah, the show, but yeah. you you are absolutely incredible. Anyway, Thank you. He's got he's got this incredible complex here. We could go outside here. We could find an ugly house. We could go to True People Search right now, or we could just Google the address and we could find out the owner and their phone number. We could call up that owner right now and say, "Hey, listen, I know that this is a random call, but I was calling about your property on twelve twelve Banana Street, and I just wanted to see when do you plan on selling." that property. And then they go, well, I am, I'm thinking about it now. I want to do it right. This is a perfect world, but this is how it happens. You have to talk to, you know, 200 people to get to this one. And, uh, and I know you want to break down some Mm -hmm. of the numbers, but, um, you have to talk to 200 people to get this one, but then they say, okay, why don't you come over, take a look, you look it up on Zillow. Okay. It says it's worth 300,000. You know, if you can get it around 50% of that, that it's a good deal. Right, so you go over there, you start negotiating, you start figuring it out. You get this property at one hundred and fifty thousand. You're like, oh my gosh, this is happening. This is really happening. I saw an ugly house. I got the phone number for free online. I talked to the property owner. We've got a contract for one hundred and fifty thousand, and that you just downloaded online. Whatever. There's yep. a ton of resources. Yep. You can get a purchase agreement anywhere. You've got one. I've got one. Anybody can download them. You get that signed. You uh, you send it to a title company that does. Uh, that works with investors. You simply Google it, boom. And now it's opened with the title company. And then you go to Facebook groups and you type in real estate investing groups, Phoenix. And then you go to whoever is the creator of that Facebook group, whoever started it, and you send them a DM. I have a great deal in this area in Tempe, Arizona. I'd love to talk to you about it. What Can I send you the details? And then you, you, and then you, go, on Zo- you go on Zillow and you look at all the flips that are currently going on and have sold recently. And you call up the agent and you say, Hey, listen, I saw you did a fantastic flip over. Here. I've got another opportunity for you. Do you want this deal? Boom. You send them the pictures, you send them the details. And now you've got, now you've got a signed agreement that they're going to pay you $15,000 for this deal. Yeah. And it what I, what I love weeks. about what you said is people get really nervous if they don't go out and pre meet buyers and, and, and build buy boxes and really understand everything about who's going to buy the property. Good deals sell themselves. Like you don't Absolutely. have to stress out all the time about building a massive cash buyer database, especially when you're new. Cause that is scary. What if I get it under contract and there's nobody to flip it to? What do I do? Like you said, we can close it. We can go back to the seller and renegotiate it and yeah. try to b- extend our time and say, hey, I'm, I need another couple of weeks to pull this deal together. Yeah. You have options. And by the way, um, free contracts for anybody who's listening, go to Cody's contract.com, C-O-D-Y-S contract.com uh, and uh, get download some contracts, or some wholesaling documents. You're right. And at least read them. Yeah. Look at them and try to understand the language. I remember when I was new, I was so nervous to fill out paperwork. My first time oh filling out paperwork gosh. in front of the seller at the kitchen table, I was like shaking. Mm-hmm. Like my pen was like, mm-hmm. and uh, I was dreading if they asked me a question and they did. Of yeah. course, they always do. Like, what yeah. does, what does this mean? Yeah. 
you know, and you're like, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> let's read it together. Yeah. You know, you're trying to sound smart. So it is a good idea to pre-read your contracts, ask your questions, get comfortable filling them out. Because if sure. you ever do negotiate with the seller and make an offer, you got to get comfortable sliding that contract over and saying, are you ready to okay this agreement today, Mr. Mm-hmm. Seller? Because if they say yes, you hand, you stop freaking talking and you hand them the pen and, yeah. and you get them to sign it. Uh, so anyway, all right. So we walk through the whole transaction. I want to go backwards for a second because yep. this is where you you shine, dude. You are yeah. such a pro at training people. Yeah, your whole thing is TTP. Talk to people. Talk to people. That's it. This is the number one place that new investors break down. Yeah, I'm scared to talk to people. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I don't want to sound stupid. I don't want to get caught in an in, a, in a, a back and forth where I don't have any of the answers and I'm just, uh, they're going to think of me as a, a fake, a phony. And, uh, or what if they say yes? Mm-hmm. I don't even know what to do next. That's the scarier part for most people. Which is crazy because yeah. we can figure that out. So yeah. explain the talk to people mentality. Yeah. Well, there's only three ways to, to get a deal, right? One way is to get a referral. Right, a real estate agent brings it to you. Another real estate buddy brings it to you. Um, you've got friends and family that know that you're a real estate investor, and they send you opportunities. Somebody DMs you, whatever. Referrals are fantastic, but you have to build up a reputation, right? People have to. Mm-hmm. It, it takes a little bit of time for people to understand what you're doing and know that they can send you these type of opportunities. So it takes some time. The second way is marketing, right? You spend money to have people call you. That's, I mean, that's how it was going forever, right? That was, those were the banded signs. That was the direct mail that you were sending out before your events yep. that people call in. That's pay per click, that's TV ads, that's radio commercials, that's billboards, that's anything that you are spending money to have people call you, right? Yep. But it's expensive. And it could get real expensive real quick. So right. you better know what happens next. Right. And then, so, and then the third way, and this is really where, um, TTP shines talking to people and being proactive is, is just call them, just, just find, just find a property, uh, that's in some sort of distress and call them up and see if you can solve that problem for them. That's it. And so it's just, it's just a more proactive approach. And I like that approach one, when I started, because I had screwed up everything and I didn't have any money one and two, it was, I could control my schedule, right? When Mm -hmm. I was getting back into this, um, when, when I was getting into wholesaling it was 2013, I had a two-year-old, I had a special needs two-year-old. So I couldn't just drop the phone for any time that I, that, that, uh, somebody called in off of marketing. And if you don't answer the phone from people calling in, you're losing out. They're going to call somebody else. You're losing out of 10, 15, 20,000. So I was like, okay, how do I control my schedule so that I'm having conversations on my time? Mm. So nine to noon, every single day, Monday through Friday, I would pick up the phone and I would call on properties that I had driven around and collected all the ugly houses. I had pulled all the pre-foreclosures. I had pulled all the divorce lists. I had pulled all the tired landlords, right? People that had owned properties that they don't live in for a long time. And I just called and called and called and called. And And my life changed from that. And so it really wasn't something that was really taught in our industry because skip tracing really wasn't a thing. Yeah. Right? It's like, how do I look up their phone number? How do I get a hold of these people? Right. What's the difference between a physical mailing address and a taxable mailing address? Right. You had to learn all this. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had uh, um, a guy, Derek Jar, who was a great investor and he did a ton. I just went to a son's game with him awesome. uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. Yeah. He he um, got connected with a skip tracing company called LexisNexis and you had to go through all these oops and you had to like, they had to come check out your office and it was in person, all these things to get this account, but he had it. So I was like, oh my gosh, now I've got all these phone numbers yep. and these houses. I'm going to just sit in an air conditioned office and call them all day long and find opportunities. And that's what I did. And then I just started getting loud about it in the Wholesaling Inc. Uh, I joined Wholesaling Inc. Um, it was a, uh, a mentorship with Tom Kroll. And I just got into the group and got real loud about, you know, guys, you could just get the phone numbers and call people up. And then boom, all of a sudden it, it started with- The whole industry skipped tracing after that. The whole industry changed yeah. to, to a yeah. more proactive approach because marketing was really expensive. Yeah, and uh, um, we have a skip tracing system built into um, my AI real estate investing system. So if you go to, you AI, to. AI yeah. real estate system.com, awesome. you can check into that. Awesome. 
Uh, okay, so what are some resources we yeah. need nowadays? Because the world has gotten easier. Now, now there's, like I said, there's softwares that have skip tracing built in. There's softwares that have data built in. There's mm -hmm. ability to do what's called lead stacking. Because that's, I mean, when what we do now, let's talk about what we do now. Yeah. As real estate wholesalers, our job is to find opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And so if you went to Brent's office or you walked over into my wholesaling company, they're just people on the phones all day long, mm -hmm. but they need people to call and people to talk to. And like yep. you said, there's two ways to get a hold. You either call out or they're calling you. Yep. And so many of our listeners reach out and they ask us how they can get involved in my actual real estate deals. Our investment firm specializes in finding deeply discounted properties, acquiring them, renovating, stabilizing both single family and multifamily properties all over the United States. That's why we're so excited to share with you clevercapitalfund.com. Now, if you have some investment capital and you want to deploy it and receive double digit returns back by real estate, then visit our website and see which fund is right for you. We have both equity funds and we have debt funds where you just get paid out every month like clockwork. All you got to do is visit www.clevercapitalfund.com today to learn more. Um, we put our best callers on the inbound lines sure. and our newer callers on the outbound lines because you got to put in those reps and you got to practice. So what are some things that somebody listening to this needs to get? So would they, would they, they need to get what, a, a, a dialer system? A dialer would like be like a Mojo phenomenal. auto dialer. So yeah. Do you have a better one than Mojo? We use Mojo. Um, we've tested out a lot of other ones. It's just the the easiest learning curve. Yeah, because it's just it's it's very basic and does does the job. Okay, so we a need a job. we we want an auto dialer. What is an auto dialer? What does it do for you? It basically you upload an Excel file of addresses and phone numbers and owners' names, and then it dials for you. When they pick up, you hear a beep, and you're just on your Bluetooth, and you're just Hello. Got it. So now we Hello. can call one, two, or three phone numbers at a time. And right. whoever picks up first, it connects you. Right. So if you have a list of 5,000 phone numbers to call, yeah. it would take you forever to smile and dial one at a time. It's but if tough th to get through 50 hand dials a day. A day. And yeah. this, you get 150 an hour. Okay. So now we're blasting through them. If they're not home, no big deal. Yep. If it goes to voicemail, you can drop a voicemail pretty yep. easily. But it makes it efficient. So yeah. we got a we got a Mojo Auto Dialer and a headset, mm -hmm. like a little Plantronics headset or your Bluetooth or something you like can, that. You do need, they still give free ones out with phones? Do they still have the? You know what I mean? Yeah, do they? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. They, nobody's given me free anything lately. Do they still do that? No, I don't know. Is this a government sponsored? <laughs> yeah, what, phone what? phone thing? Yeah, free free for everybody. Um, so you need a Mojo Auto Dialer. You need the phone headset or something so that way you can have your hands free. Yeah. Uh, you're probably going to want some lead intake forms or a script. How important it yeah. is to, to in the beginning to use a script or at least 100%. practice with a script. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I talked to 45,000 property owners myself. And over that time, I tried everything, every different, I, I tried different words, different, different questions, different approach. And uh, I, I came up with a script that worked the best. And so that's been used uh, over and over and over and over and, uh, and, and has been white labeled, uh, you know, unofficially by a lot of, of course. people. But that, if it's good and it works, yeah. you know, they're going to, great artists still. But, the, but that's fine. So um, yeah, I think it's really important just to give you the comment confidence and but, just, but, uh, so yeah. to clarify you started you had to do the school of hard knocks oh yeah and you had to build your script oh yeah i had to do the school of hard knocks and build my script but mm -hmm. eventually now your students get your script yeah my students get my script yep. and eventually you get so good at the script you don't even need the script right right yeah. and now you can just have fluid conversations on the fly because you know how to anticipate anticipation is power there's yeah. certain power principles anticipation is one of them learning your skills and your craft so well yep Having those 45,000 phone calls, now you're a Jedi master mm -hmm. on the phones. They could throw every objection at you and you know exactly how to overcome it. They can, yeah. there's, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to get you stumped. No, because when you ask somebody if they would consider an offer on their property and you're on the phone, there's only six responses they give you. So if you know how to respond to those six responses, then you feel a lot, you, you feel like a gunslinger. You're like, throw it out. Like yeah. whatever, whatever you got, hit me with it. Cause I know how to get this back on track. And so, um, yes is a response that they would consider an offer. No is a response. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're thinking about it in the future. How much will you give me is a very common yep. response. Uh, who are you and how'd you get my number? 
That's the six responses. It's some version of those six responses every single time. So if you've practiced it and you understand that you're only going to get one of these six responses, you're going to be able to keep that conversation going if it's an actual lead. You can anticipate because you're yeah. prepared. That's it. Yep. All right. So you got your you got your lead intake form. A lead intake form just keeps you organized because yeah. you're going to ask them. You're, you're just basically on these first calls going on a fact-finding mission. Yeah. Are you open to an offer? Mm-hmm. Tell me about your property. Mm-hmm. You know, um, maybe how much would you want for your property if you sold it and got a cash offer here today? Yep. Um, there's just certain there's things. There's four pillars. Can, can, Condition. Yep. Timeline, right? When do they yep. want their money? motivation, what's their problem, and price. You find out the condition, timeline, motivation, price, and it's got to be all wrapped inside of the, they actually want to sell burrito. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like that is critical. You could, you could talk to people uh, and have a great, the most unbelievable (laughs) conversation. They're being so sweet to you and they're being nice. You're like, this is awesome. This is the greatest call I've ever had, but they don't want to sell their property. Yeah. They just want you to like, comp it for them or just they're just lonely yeah they just, they just want, want to have a chat. conversation they just want you to see uh, what they did to their you know rose garden yeah the they want to tell yard. you about the the tile that they just installed oh, in the bathroom yeah. how proud they are they want to tell you about all the birthday job. parties that they threw <laughs> and all the functions and everything and so you, you and you said it perfectly. Do they want to sell this property? You know what I mean? That's the first thing. And then uh, condition, timeline, motivation, price. That's the scaffolding, the skeleton of the conversation. Okay. And then you want to be in a quiet place. Yeah. I It drives me crazy mm-hmm. when people are trying to make their calls like on the go, like going through a shopping. Oh my gosh. Like they're at the grocery store trying to check out and they like got one phone and they're talking to the teller and they're talking to the homeowner. And it's like, no wonder you didn't get the deal, dummy. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. your rapport was completely broken. They know you weren't present. It's better to just say, Hey, I'm, I'm walking out of a store right now. I'm gonna call you in five. Yep. Right. And get 100%. to a quiet place and get your script out, get your head right. And like, yeah, this is why I used to, and I was crazy. I used to wake up and do calls all morning long. Like how you said nine to noon, yep. but I'm at home. Yeah. I could have wore my dress PJs if I wanted to. I put a mirror up. You have dress PJs? Yeah, of course, dude. Dang, I'm looking fly dude, all the you time. You are fancy. I, uh, I, <laughs> I put a mirror up. Yeah. I put my ob- uh, overcoming objections cheat sheet sure. that I made. Yep. I had my script in front of me. Mm-hmm. I wore a suit mm-hmm. because I wanted to feel like I was going to battle. Yeah. I'm trying to buy one of the biggest assets in somebody's life. Yeah. And I'm trying to do it like a pro. So I want it, even though like it's, 8 30 in the morning i'm starting to bang phones i'm wearing a full yeah. suit yeah. and uh and that's just how i roll because i i i believe that if i can get in the right frame and have that energy my confidence would come through my voice it's a state it's a state right you're you're you're, you're you have a, a, a taller posture to what yeah. you're doing you know what i mean and i also didn't sit Oh, no. I walked. No. Yeah. I walked. I highly recommend a standing desk. Mm-hmm. And if you could put a treadmill underneath that desk, like walk, talk, put your put your physical reps in yep. and, and your call reps in. And man, by the well, end, it affects- and how consistent does somebody need to stay hitting the phones before they start to get some competence, confidence, and traction? 90 days. And I tell this, and, and a lot of people don't follow this. Uh, I say you shouldn't hire anybody before you talk to a thousand property owners yourself. You mean like a caller for you? Yes. Because that's at whatever. I mean, anything. I mean, a virtual assistant that you think needs to handle the paperwork or do all this other stuff. Like you're not ready to lead a company. All right. Why don't you talk to a thousand people first, build up the experience. It's going to give you so much more confidence, so much more skills. And I don't care if the market crashes. I don't care if you go through a really tough time in your life. I don't care if you have to pay for some big medical operation and all your finances are wiped out or whatever else. If you have those skills, they last. And I'm telling you, you are a different person if you've talked to a thousand people about their property. Oh, that yeah. is a skill that doesn't go away. And it blends into the rest of your 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 life. All of a sudden, you're not afraid to talk to that girl anymore, that guy anymore. Oh, All yeah. of a sudden, you're not afraid to communicate your feelings to your family or to your friends or whatever else. You're just more confident. You're a better communicator. Now that I think back, I get I got laid so much more after I became a good cold caller. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. So listen, um, <laughs> this this is great. The, the last piece of the puzzle is you probably need some sort of software that pulls it all together. 
Um, there's a lot of great ones out there. Um, we use something called the Deal Automator. And like I already shared, the AI real estate system.com. Just go there and see what we have to offer. But what are what some other ones that you use? Yeah, but Cody, I, I like keeping everything. L- like all of those things are unbelievable. It's going to keep you organized. It's going to allow you to actually keep accountability with your team and yourself. Um, with me, in the beginning, I used an accordion binder that, <laughs> Vanilla I, that, folder. I, that I bought off of uh, like Staples, that, that I got at Staples. Yeah. One had one through 31, which is the days of the month. And then the other one had January through December. So you kept so your system simple. I, I pulled out the the June 21st and those are my leads for follow-up and I would call them up and boom, I'm rocking and rolling, right? And so I think that once you get to the point where you have some momentum, then you get the tools, then you get all these things coming in. Because what I find is people get these tools, all of a sudden they're the masters of these tools. They Guess spend all their time nerding out on how to use the tool and not actually making the calls and do, I, the, trying to do the deals. The brokest real estate investors I know know the most about their CRM. Okay. It's just a fact. Yeah, that's true. You know true. what I mean? So why don't you start with the hunting and then work on the gathering? Uh, uh, you, you know, know what it's I mean? funny that you say that because I remember one time I, I had the same thing. I had vanilla folders and my beat up Nissan pickup truck and I was rushing to an appointment and it was a hot deal yeah. and the light turned red and I wasn't paying attention. I looked up and I had to slam on my brakes and all like 20 of my property files fl- flew off the seat onto the floorboard and just shuffled around. And I was like, ah! I'm like, dang it. So I literally was reshuffling and I I don't even know if I put the appointment paperwork back in the folder, but I just grabbed it and went in mm-hmm. and totally winged the appointment with somebody else's property paperwork oh, yeah. in my folder. Oh, my thinking that, uh, thinking like, oh my God. Did you get the deal? I, I You know, I don't remember, probably. Yeah. I got pretty good. This is what's great. Um, you probably are so deadly on the phones now yeah. because you, you just talked and pitched and got defeated so many times that now it's, you've internalized it. You're just, you're so confident. You can yeah. maneuver these conversations. You can, you're a true master at influence and persuasion on the phones. Yeah. I was good on the phones. I was much better in person. Sure. And that's only because I got l- told no, laughed off doorsteps, pushed away from hundreds and hundreds of kitchen tables. Mm-hmm. I, because back when I started, it was door knocking. It was going to pre foreclosures. It was trying to get into the house. You have your paperwork. It wasn't a lot of like in the, like now it's like I can remotely wholesale anywhere in the country Mm -hmm. from Arizona. Mm -hmm. We have students in other, what's like, you probably have some in other countries that are doing stuff here in the States and they have maybe deal partners or boots on the ground and other people they work with to help pull it off. A lot of incredible from Israel. Israel, Those guys are wild. They are so good. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've had lots of remote students, Mm -hmm. but back in the day, I never thought like that. I was never, I was only trying to do a deal down the road. Yeah. And, uh, that's, was my skill was in-person negotiation. Mm-hmm. And eventually I got good on the phones. Uh, what? Who would we call? I want to just kind of review just for everybody listening. I have a list here and yep. you tell me if I'm missing anything. Okay. Um, leads to call because yep. pe- it's like, all right, I got my little system set up. I got my dialer. I'm ready to go. Who do I call? Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to look up leads that you've already been maybe mailing. Yep. We're going to talk to people like farm and area where there's maybe high cash buying activity right? Mm-hmm. If you're in a small town and there's no like investor activity, don't market and work that area. Yeah, Maybe go to the town next to it where there's more activity. Yeah. And you, how do we find activity? How do we know where the investors are? Well, I mean, you could do a quick search just in, in Facebook and just see if there's investor groups or go to meetup.com and, and type in real estate investor and see if there's groups. And if you see that there's, you know, 15 different groups and you see that there's 10 different uh, Facebook um, groups and you're like, okay, this is probably a pretty good idea. This is just, if you want to do it in t- two seconds, right? Yeah. The other way is you can go and research and just find all the cash purchases through whatever tools. I don't know what tool you use. Yeah, it's a deal automator. Deal automator. You could go into deal automator and be able to look at all the cash purchases and see what areas are people buying mm-hmm. in. You know what I mean? And then you get a pretty good idea. But, you know, Cody, I, I don't know. I, I've done I've done deals in... Bisbee, Arizona, right? I've done deals. Not much going on in Bisbee. Overguard, Arizona. I've done deals in Scottsdale. I've done deals in, you you know what I mean? So I think 
if the price is right, you can find somebody that's going to that, that's yeah, gonna might take be the that neighbor, deal. and you don't even they're not normally a, an investor, yeah. but they want they want the neighboring property. It's just when you have a smaller market, you need to expand your market at some point if you have big goals. If your goals are half a million dollar business, a million dollar business, two million dollar business, you're going to have to expand at some point. Yeah. But you can do and, it anywhere. And you can always call like a, a title company, a local title company mm-hmm. and just say, hey, do you have cash buyers that are investors that are buying properties? Yeah. Oh yeah, I got a bunch of them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So now you know there's activity. Um, absentee owner, high equity. Mm-hmm. Okay, that means they they don't live in the property and the property has a lot of equity. Yep. Owner occupied, high equity. Mm-hmm. Out of state owner, Right, which yep. is absentee because you can be absentee in state and absentee out of state. Sure, uh, probate t- or tax liens. Yep, uh, pre uh, foreclosure or sixty day lates, pre foreclosure or foreclosure mm-hmm. leads, vacant property leads, and expired or canceled listing leads. Love it. Good list. Awesome. List. All right, so we gave you a list the, of people. The, the only thing that I would really say is, in my experience, eighty percent of people get their first deal just from driving for dollars. Just find another house. you call farming. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's literally just get on your skateboard, get on your scooter, get on your Lamborghini, get in your Tesla, get in whatever you want to do and just drive neighborhoods that are older. And how do I find those? Google map it. I don't care. You know where the older neighborhoods are. Just go drive around until you find some properties and you look at them. And if visually you're like, that property needs some work. Write it down or use an app. There's incredible apps out there yeah, we, that will do all the work for you. We have an app that's attached to the AI real estate system Yeah, where you can be in front of the property, you put in the address, and it pulls up all the tax records, it pulls up all the comps, and it pulls up the AI scores mm-hmm. of that property. It'll literally, based on the algorithm, tell you this is a hot wholesale deal based on 136 billion data points. Right. It's the most powerful driving kind of tech yeah. because then from right there, you can hit, please give me their phone number. You can skip trace, mm-hmm. send them a mail. You can hit one button in mail. You can even take a picture of the front of the house and it'll mail merge the picture onto the postcard mm-hmm. that says, is this your property? Mm-hmm. Fire it out to the taxable mailing address. A couple of weeks later, you get a call. You took a picture of my house, sent me a postcard. Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. Right, and then you can, you can ask Listen, your questions. The, the the I can't find any deals uh, argument is over. I mean, there's just two. I mean, you you can literally just drive around. You can use a tool that's going to tell you everything about that property, what they owe on it, what the AI score is on the potential. I mean, it's bananas. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely bananas. That like it's not. This is not an issue of. Is there enough properties out there? Statistically, the U.S. Census, 6 to 10% of properties are in distress at all times. All right? That's 143 million residential properties. If you go 6 to 10%, that could be upwards to 14 million opportunities. Mm. There's way more opportunities than there are us. I love that stat. I've never heard and that before. Batch, listen to this. Batch just had a consultant come in and try to figure out how many people consider themselves real estate wholesalers between 70 and 100,000. That's it. So we got 14 million opportunities for 70. How many people are doing it full time, you think? Yeah, maybe 10,000. Hey, maybe, maybe. So you got 10,000 going towards 14 million? There is a conveyor belt of opportunities out there. I love it. And that. if you want to be a real estate entrepreneur, and it's it, it's you, you have that, you want to own the rentals, you want to buy the apartments, you want to develop, you want to do all these things, you want to own an 18,000 square foot, multi million dollar commercial space, it starts with the foundation. Can you source deals? Mm-hmm. That's the bottom. That is that is the land that we build all of these other things off of. So why wouldn't you go out there and build a wholesaling business that you replace yourself over time? You you one, you do your first deal. Two, you do it consistently so you can go full time and replace your income. Three, you start firing yourself from certain roles in the business. And four, now you've got a cash cow, an ATM machine that's kicking you off passive income that you now go to take and, and buy the best deals that you run across. Dude, you nailed it. That's the blueprint. People are like, Cody, are you still wholesaling? I'm like, yes and no. Right. I'm not making calls. Right. I'm not going to appointments. No. I'm not doing anything. I own a wholesaling business Mm -hmm. that other people manage and run Mm -hmm. that we make anywhere on a horrible month. We're doing 80 grand Mm -hmm. on a great month. Right now we're doing like 150 grand. Mm -hmm. It used to be 250, but a couple of Junes ago when the world fell apart, it got a lot harder for us to, to, to keep it at that scale. 
Um, but it's coming back in a big way. And that's why I wanted to record this podcast right now because in the last month or two, mm-hmm. wholesaling has been great. It's been popping back. Buyers are coming back. Mm-hmm in a major way, Mm -hmm. like rehabbing's kind of leveled back out. Like a lot of the markets kind of stabilized. And now even I'm seeing, and this is how you know when things are like trending in a good direction or the wrong direction, is the hard money lenders start advertising rates are down, rates are down. Mm -hmm. It's uh, at one point we're at like 7%. Then it went up to like nine or 10%. Now it's back down to 8%. Hard money. Yeah. Okay. And so that's how, that's a good barometer because they're really watching the market and like, they don't want to lose investor capital. So it's come back down. Rehabbers have come back out. Yep. And there is an Airbnb bus going on right now. There's a lot of people dumping their Airbnb properties. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people dumping their secondary properties. If they inherited a property, they're like, we don't want to deal with this. Mm-hmm. We're out. Uh, lots of opportunities out there. So, Well, we have the perfect storm, honestly, for wholesaling because when interest rates go up, the, the 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 typical home seller stays in their property, right? They don't want to sell their property and then get uh, a, a mortgage that's twice the amount that they're paying for the same house. So most people are just waiting for the interest rates to come down so that the inventory is locked with, with owner-occupied. So what are people selling? Airbnbs, rental properties, inherited properties, and flippers. Flippers are making a killing right now because they put out these unbelievable properties. They're getting multiple offers on them because there's nothing to buy. Yep. There's going to be over a million less property sales this year than last year, right? So a million less the demand is still there. People still want to buy properties. People are still getting older. People are still getting better jobs and getting better paid. And they, they're tired of paying rent. They still want to buy. The demand's there. We look at our inventory here in Maricopa County. We have just over a month, a month and a half of inventory. It's the lowest it's been in a long time. It's like, what are we talking about here? You put and a property in the market and it and it goes. So that that what it, what that brings in is that brings in the money, that brings in the cash buyers that want to buy these properties. And they do. Do not want to sit down with a property owner that has smoked 100,000 cigarettes inside their house and has 14 cats running around and their property is destroyed and go and sit down there and, 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 and one, market for those, spend money marketing for those, but then also have people on their team go in there and negotiate those contracts. They don't want it. You know what they want? They want the property. They just want a silver platter. Give me the property. With the property on it. That's why we make the money that we make. That's the value that we provide. We're going out there being the marketing engine for every fix and flipper and, and a lot of rental portfolio builders out there. We find the deals. Yeah. Because we're working with that distressed property owner. But we're having those conversations. Fun, funny story about that. I get a call from this lady. I put out some postcards. Mm-hmm. And the way direct mail works is it's like... Um, it, you get you 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 go along and, and if you stay consistent with direct mail long enough, you all of a sudden get this hockey stick return. Mm-hmm. It's like exponential returns. And, and you got to send like nine, 10, 11, 12, 15 postcards to the same homeowner. Mm-hmm. This is where people fail with direct mail. They send one or two or three and they go, oh, it didn't work. It's like, no dummy, you didn't stay consistent for long enough. You got to farm that area, farm that list. And over time, all of a sudden you're like, I'm getting more calls than I can handle because it finally hockey sticked. Yep. Because what they do is they just take that postcard and throw it in the drawer for a few months mm-hmm. and they keep seeing it and keep seeing it. So when their time finally comes where they're ready, well, this lady, she was... Everything you just said, hoarder, Mm -hmm. had 30 cats. Mm -hmm. It was nasty in her house in South Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. And this was maybe like, maybe like eight years ago or something like that, nine years ago. And she told me on the phone right out of the gates, I'm meeting with you. Then one hour after you, I'm meeting with this other person. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned who, I said, who is the other person? She goes, oh, somebody named da, da, da. And I knew who they were. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, shit, they're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to get the deal. I'm going, I don't necessarily always want to go first, but I think, okay, I'm going to go first. Yeah. So I go to this lady's house. There is literally columns of things like the pathways where you have to like yeah. snake around and get to certain things. And the only space in her entire house that wasn't full of garbage or cats and shit and everything else that's disgusting about that scenario was a couch. Mm-hmm. The couch was all full except for one space where she sits. Yeah. So we walk in and I'm in a suit, like a dumbass. I overdressed. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was walking into a hoarder house. 
And uh, I can tell right out of the gate, she's kind of uncomfortable with me. Mm -hmm. I'm like a little too shiny for her. Mm -hmm. And she probably thought, oh, this guy's judging me. She was embarrassed about her property, but she had to sell. And so we do the things we normally do. I walked, I say, hey, show me around your property. I had my yellow legal pad. I was taking some notes with a red pen. I let her watch me take the notes, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I had my contracts with me. I already pre-comped the property. I already had like all the comps pr printed out so I can kind of share with her what I'm seeing in the sure. local market and just educate her. And just building rapport, lots of rapport building. Well, when we finally get done with about 35, 40 minutes of this, we go back to the couch area. There's cats everywhere. There's shit everywhere. And she sits down in the couch. Now mm -hmm. I'm standing at this point and underneath my feet is like 13 piles of cat shit mm -hmm. and dog shit. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what, she, just shit. Yeah. And I see her sit down. Normally I mirror mm -hmm. them, Sure. but I don't have any place to sit. Yeah. And I'm in a suit, like a thousand dollar suit. And I'm like looking around and I can feel the tension in the air building. I can, I'm losing the deal. The rapport is breaking. Yeah. I get that gut feeling like, okay, I'm fucked. Like I'm out. Yeah. And I just make a decision right then and there to sit on the floor below her mm -hmm. in my suit mm -hmm. on the pile of shit mm -hmm. and complete talk and finish talking to her. Yeah. I ended up getting that deal as it took me about 30 or 40 minutes longer because I had to work really hard to get her comfortable again. Mm -hmm. I get in her contract. I'm walking out the other appointments walking in and he sees my contract and he said, oh, you got the deal? And I said, I got the deal. He said, okay, well, good for you. And I said, do I have shit on my ass? And I turned around and I showed him my ass and he goes, yep. yep. And I'm like, I earned it. Yeah. And he was like, you earned it. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. So sometimes you got to just, you got to play the game, yeah. you know, and, and that rehabber does not want to go out there and do that. No. Two hours sitting in shit to get a deal. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to scare anybody listening that that's what wholesaling is because that's a rare instance, but I've had everything happen to me. Oh yeah. I've bought and I, I, I've had, I've done deals with attorneys and they're smart and they're educated and, and they have 50 billion documents of research and they still sell their house at a discount. So it's, it's not like oh, the yeah. distressed person that's always in pain. That's kind of Looney Tunes. You get attorneys, you get elderly, you get young people that just inherited a product. You get the whole spectrum, right? I would say every 90 days, we have somebody that really shocks us, really shocks us to the point where we're like, what is this world of real estate where they just don't care at all about the price at all? They literally are their biggest, their biggest goal is for us to win. I had a real estate broker that's been a broker for 30 years. Uh, we had gone out there and my acquisition manager was like, I need you to come on this appointment because this is this is bananas. I don't know what this woman's talking about. Uh, but come out here and uh and and see if you know maybe you can um, you know, dig in a little bit deeper and see what, what the motivation is. And I get there and I pulled it up and uh, and on Zillow it was like 230,000. Right. And I get there and it's not bad. It's not, it's, it's, it's not that there were some holes in the ceiling. It needed a, a, a updating. It needed, you know, a freshening, but it wasn't bad. It was a rental for a while. And, um, I said, okay, so what do you want for the property? She said nine grand. And I said, what? She goes, yeah. And then You're like, give excuse me, me, give me 9,000. And I go, well, what I go, have you sold real estate? Have you sold any deals before? You're a landlord. It seems like you, you would know, you know, values around here. And, um, and she goes, yeah, I've been a broker for century 21 for 30 years. And I was like, what? And she goes, and I go, okay. Girl, so, is this your house? Or are you so, selling yeah, somebody else's house like, right now? Are you the real owner? You yeah. know what I mean? Can I see your ID? No. Um, and she said, yeah. And I go, well, if you put it on the market right now, what do you think you'll get? She goes, well, it needs some work. So probably 200. And I go, well, why, why are you giving me $191,000 with the equity? She goes, oh, honey, I just want you to win. And I was like, what? 9,000. Yeah. She said, yeah, I just want, you, she, translation, I just want you to win. I'm going through a divorce and I'd rather have you no, have it than she was, him. She was, <laughs> she, she was single. I talked to her attorney. Her, her like wealth attorney. Yeah, I talked to her the priest at the Catholic Church that she goes. This is just to. a real. This is a real I, scenario. I went to. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I like. I, it wasn't. She had no. She had no uh, siblings. She had no children. Uh, she was older. She had her own property uh, paid off. She just didn't want to deal with the tenants anymore, and she wanted to sell it to a real estate investor. And I was like, well, 
why don't I give you more? Like, let, let's make it yeah. a deal. Let's make it a better deal. She's like, I'm going to sell this property for 9,000. It's going to be to you or somebody else. So who, what do you want to do? You're all sliding the contract over nice and slow. Like, all right. Well, if you okay this agreement, <laughs> right? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, it, by the way, um, if anybody caught that, I never say, will you sign my contract? No, agreement. It's, it's wordsmithing, yeah. right? And that's when you get into like- Contracts the, are for the, like- yeah, it's scary to say, yeah. will you sign my contract? But hey, uh, would you consider okaying this agreement if the price was right? That's it. Yeah. Uh, and here's what else I want people to remember. In this game, it's a game of stamina. 15% mm-hmm. of my deals, and you tell me if this is your experience, about 15% of my deals happen sometime around first contact. Like maybe within the first 30 days of first contact. 85% of my deals come in the follow-up. Well, if you're doing marketing- it's it's pretty fast. Like we looked at, okay, and it's not the first, like, give me this price. Uh, and I'm do talking it, about right? cold calling out. Oh, yeah. cold calling out. Oh, no, it takes calling in. Days. Yeah. Calling yeah. in is different. You're yes. going to get a much higher success ratio. Yeah. So here's the thing if you're making the calls yourself, uh, you're going to get a deal every 200 people you talk to. And okay. it's typically about 20 hours of calls. And that freaks everybody out, right? They're like, oh my gosh, I, I haven't talked to anybody about real estate, right? How am I going to talk to 200? One at a time. That's it. Just just do it one at a time. Because on the back end of that is fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So if you look at the hourly rate that you're making, it's like a thousand dollars an hour. So if you were if you were standing behind somebody new, or I was standing somebody behind somebody new, we we're in their living room or their bedroom or their dorm room or their barracks or wherever they're making their calls in their office, and we're giving them ten crispy hundred dollar bills every hour that they make calls, we, we would have to tear people off the phone. Yeah, they have to tear people off the phone. That's the mentality that you have to have with this. So uh, one out of two hundred, if you're making the calls yourself, now it can be upwards to. 10 times that amount if you hire a VA that is um, that English is their second language. It takes way more conversations uh, when you hire it out. So that's why I say if you want momentum fast, do the calls yourself. Uh, in the beginning. In the beginning. And then replace yourself. And 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 you should. You and you and you should put in those reps. I right. it I, and it's funny because a lot of times like they're like, oh, I've been a real estate agent for 15 years. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, cool. How many wholesale deals have you done? None. Okay, get on the phones. Yeah. That's Go it. back to basics. That's it. What what other I was what a manager. I, I was a manager at a Verizon store, so I know how to lead people. No, you don't, ding dong. <laughs> get on the damn phones. What other industry do you not put in the work early? Yeah. I, what what anything? What skill at all? Is there not some sort of apprenticeship period where you are putting in the work and really earning it? I don't know a single person that is wildly successful, a true multimillionaire that didn't put in the work early on that actually earned it themselves. You got to you got to go through that period. You got to go through that tough part. Uh, I want to just give everybody six things to gather on their first phone call. And then I want to move on to making more than one type of offer. Love and it. then end, end with some creative talk. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to kind of close this whole thing down, when you're talking to people, the main overarching goals in the beginning, build rapport, uncover their why, gather property data, establish price, try to set up an appointment to view their property if it's local, um, and then anchor your higher authority. The reason I say those are the six main goals on the first call is because so many times new investors, they come guns blazing. Mm-hmm. They have a mission in mind. They're not even paying attention to building rapport. They're just like talking at somebody. Mm-hmm. And oh, I'm a cash buyer. I buy properties. I can pay you top dollar. Here's what your property's worth. Here's what I can give you. Do you want to do a deal? And it's like, people are just like, whoa, what the heck? Mm-hmm. And they are too aggressive and they, and yeah. they, and Really, you just need to be good at asking questions. That's it. You you need to be a pro at just, hey, what's happening in your life to make you potentially want to sell your house to me, right? That's a great question. What and how questions. How else have you tried to sell your property before talking to me? Did you try through a real estate agent? Did you try to another, did talk to another investor? What's going on? I think asking what's the goal with the property is very important. And what's important to you about the buyer for your property? Ooh, those are great. Right? Yeah. If you had a magic wand and you could create the perfect buyer, what would they look and feel like? And then if then questions, right? If you got the perfect offer right now, then are you ready to sell it? Are you ready to move forward? 
Yeah. Right. Like if then questions are so powerful, but it's, it's the tone of voice, right? It's the tonality. Your tone on the, on the phone is your body language and look up any, any psychology on human uh, communication. Uh, body language is so important. And the, and, and that is what you get with the tonality. So you really have to work on your ability to use your tone to, to make people feel comfortable opening up. And so if you, if you just smack him with question after question after question, it turns an interrogation, not a conversation. Yeah. 7%, how we communicate 7%. You got it right here? <laughs> yeah, I got it. Dude, I'm on this baby. 7% of how we communicate is the words we choose to yeah. use. That's a very conscious thing. 38% is the tone of your voice. So we're actually communicating a lot more just through the tonality of mm-hmm. your voice. And tonality is whether you're high pitched or low pitched, you know, and also pacing. How fast are you talking? The speed. If I'm talking to a good old boy from Texas mm-hmm. and I'm a driver from New York and I'm like, hey, we're going to get this deal done. And da, 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 this good old, the good old boy from Texas mm-hmm. is going to be going crazy because yeah. this city slicker is yeah. going to try to run him over. And yeah. Right away, rapport is being broken. Mm-hmm. And then 55% is your physiology. And this is why I wore the suit and I put up a mirror and I stood up because I knew that my tonality would change. Mm-hmm. My energy would come through the phone differently mm-hmm. if I was prepared. That's it. I was prepared. That's it. Um, all right. Let's, uh, and oh, last thought, anchoring a higher authority. Just a little negotiation technique to help you newer people. You never want to be the end all be all in the negotiation. If you're on the phones and you're building rapport and you're building a relationship, you're asking the what and how questions and you're connecting with the seller, the last thing you want to say is something like, well, we can pay you $200,000, take it or leave it. And they go, I'll leave it. Mm -hmm. And now you're dead in the water because your back's against the wall. But if through the whole time you're talking and I'm saying, you know, I'm super excited that we're, we're, we're talking about your property. You know, once we're done and I gather all the information, I'm going to go into my business partner, Brent's office. And Brent is actually the final decision maker, but I'm pretty confident that this is the type of property that we would be interested in. Yeah. And I'm just slowly anchoring this guy, Brent, who's the, he has the purse strings. He's Mm -hmm. the decision. He's the higher authority. And it doesn't have to be weird or blatant, but over time, what, what can always happen though, if I say something like, Hey, listen, we can offer up to $200,000 for your property, would that be something you would consider okay in agreement to here today? Mm -hmm. And if they say no, I can then kind of backpedal and go, okay, well, what do we need to do to make this happen? Because it has to be reasonable Mm -hmm. because I got to go get approval from Brent. Yeah, And so now I have that person there. So that's why I say, start weaving it in on that first phone call. And over time, you can still be the I don't want to say good cop, bad cop, but that's kind of the philosophy. Mm-hmm. So you'll always have somebody to go to. It could be your dog. It could be your significant other, but have somebody else other than you as the end. I the love other. it. Yeah. I, my, my acquisition managers use it all the time for everything. You know what I mean? And, and having those conversations and I'm always the bad guy. I'm always the bad guy. You they're they're the always hammer. on their side. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it, that is your, powerful. Your job is really, if you really envisioned even if you're on the phones, you're at this kitchen table and our whole job is to slide over next to them. Mm-hmm. We're not at the other end of the table. No. We're next to them. Yeah. We're collaborating. That's We're going to solve this housing problem together. Mm-hmm. And when they feel that collaboration, it's called bridging the gap. Mm-hmm. When we bridge the gap and we identify the gap and then we bridge it with the solution and the offer and yeah. we show the supporting evidence and they feel comfortable with it and the rapport is there, you got a deal. Mm-hmm. And if you, my biggest wholesale deal recently was a little over 80 grand. 80, 80, like 3,000. Mm-hmm. Where the hell else are you going to work five hours and make 83 Gs? Like, it's the best. It's the best when well, that listen, happens. And I, I know for a fact, you get you get 50 grand wired into your account or a check for 50 grand, your brain breaks. It's life You start thinking about money a whole lot different. All of a sudden, you're like, wait a second, what is happening? I could, Maybe I could do 100,000. Have you done a million, a million a year wholesaling? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you remember oh. when you first started and you just wanted to make four grand? Can I just flip a house Dude, and make four grand real quick? My my <laughs> like Mount Everest was four hundred grand a year. 
Like I thought that was, you know, you're in the top 1%. That's absolutely incredible. Take home 400 grand a year after taxes. Holy cow. That would be the most incredible thing ever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then obviously you get and you hit a million and, you, and yeah, your standards yeah, yeah, change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's just end with a little bit of creative talk because yes. nowadays you can't just show up. You're going to get told no a lot if you're just making cash offers. Yes. So this is where the world of creative finance comes in because a lot of homeowners put a uh, refinance since 2020 to 2022, mm-hmm. 2023 mm-hmm. into these really great mortgages, mm-hmm. two, three, four percent mortgages. Those are gold. Mm-hmm. And like 55% of every homeowner in the United States refied yeah. in a two-year period. Mm-hmm. A lot of people already had good mortgages on there. And there's a lot of free and clear property. So how important is it to learn the creative finance side of things in today's world? Yeah. I um, After you've done, I would say at least 25 wholesale deals. Okay. So I come would. in Master the art of making cash offers. Listen, there is a reason that I have a rhino on my shirt. There's a reason we're the rhino tribe. You charge like a 9,000 pound rhinoceros towards one goal and you stay focused. And that is finding people that want to sell their properties for cash. And that's what you do. Now, if somebody wants to do something else and they want more or they don't have as much equity, pass it on to somebody that that knows how to do those and either get a referral fee or split the deal with them or JV with it, but find somebody that has expertise in that. Because if you start going and trying to put your butt on all these different saddles, you're not going to ride any of these deals. Mm. All right. I'm just telling Great you. Great advice. Well, I just- Yeah, it's good there, advice. There Counterintuitive is, there is, from what a lot of other people are saying right now out there. Well, listen, I mean, it's we run into some really great creative opportunities, but I've I've personally coached over 3000 wholesalers like they ha- I have them in my cell phone and every time they go towards the creative approach too early that's all they see and all of a sudden all that income that they were making all those big wholesale che- checks start drying up so mm. I stay absolutely focused until you have the ability to really start looking at a different uh, technique. And, and really, it's not that much different, right? Do they want to sell this property? And you either get a wholesale price or wholesale terms. You know what I mean? And so working the terms um, is is a wonderful strategy, but just leverage somebody else until you get this rolling. I, I, great. I, yeah, that's great advice. Because, and then the other thing is like people go, oh, I'm going to do creative and I'm going to keep these properties. And you're like, that's the biggest nightmare of all time Yeah, is building a giant rental portfolio before you actually have a business. Because most people are like, well, it cash flows $300 a month. Yeah, <laughs> but it costs you five grand a year for upkeep. All right, so you've, you're losing money right now. Okay. And now if you go into some of the smaller markets with lower price, you're going to get more cash flow. That's great. But guess what happens in lower income properties? They beat it to hell. They beat them up. So now all of a sudden, you're looking at these rental properties that you got under some creative terms and you own the property, but it's sinking you because one, it's taking your attention. Attention management is critical. Two, you're not making any cash flow on it, really. Three, that appreciation that you just had, guess what? Every 10 years, interior design changes, okay? Every 10 years. So are you going to go in and put 50, 60 grand into that property? Are you going to go to get the highest absolute value out of that? No. If you're going to buy a property, buy it for 10, 15, 20 years minimum. But I would say build your business focused on finding discounted properties, making a ton of money, create an ATM machine, then go buy the assets. You know what I mean? So when it comes to creative finance, you can you can coach it. I coach it. We go through it. But if it's somebody that's never done a real estate deal before, trying to negotiate a sub two or trying to negotiate a novation or trying to no, uh, do a lease option or a, de- uh, a land deed or, or a contract for deed or do um, any, any owner financing, it's a huge distraction in my opinion. I think that's a mic drop moment right there yeah. because you know that, that, that is probably the best advice you can give somebody who's new. More advanced people, we yeah. offer creative all the time, but I, I think after hearing you say it like that, I, I 100% agree. If you're brand new, stick on one horse, Listen, ride that thing all the way to the finish. You said 25 deals. Yeah. I, I think it should be maybe even more than that yeah. after hearing you talk. There's a guy, Pete that, Fortunato, out of out You know, of Florida. that was one of my mentors. Right? Was he? Yeah. So my, my mentors were Jack Miller, John mm-hmm. Shaw, Pete Fortunato, mm-hmm. and Lyle Wall. Love it. That group yep. was the OG creative OGs. finance, most crazy- 
slicer and dicer transactional engineers yeah. in the game. They've been doing this since the late 70s, 80s, all through the 90s. They were coaching. They finally started doing seminars and stuff. Mm -hmm. When I heard Pete talk the first time, it mm -hmm. fried my brain. I had no idea what he was saying. It was I gibberish. fell asleep. <laughs> I'm not joking. Yeah, I believe it. I was in Tampa Bay. It was two and a half hours into it. Pete has the exact same tone the whole time. Yeah. He's got those ridiculous 1990s ties. Yeah. He even has, I think he might even has a pocket protector sometimes. And his son was out there in like a cutoff shirt doing registration. I mean, it was just like, where am I? What, what is happening here? Yeah. And he was going bananas on some sort of lease option wrap and, and what he was doing with insurance for properties in Florida because of flood. And I was just like... I was asleep. <laughs> and, but he did say what, it, what I was getting back to is he was like, if you don't want to use your brain, just do cash, right? Like just give them cash offers. If you want to, you actually use your brain, then learn these creative things. I think the dumber you are early, the better. I think the less you know about other strategies and you just focus on giving people cash offers that want cash and, and, and build up your experience there, sitting at the dinner table, negotiating, having conversations, then that'll lead you into these more creative paths. Dude, nailed it. And, and, and what advice would you give just to emotionally get prepared for this business? Yeah. We'll end on a little little personal development high note. Sure. Um, how would you talk to a new investor? It's their first coaching call. What are you going to tell them? You're done listening to music in your car. You're done. You're done. It, it, until like, if you get off work and you're not listening to something, you're not listening to this podcast, you're not listening to uh, YouTube videos, you're not learning in your car, it's a huge missed opportunity. All right. First, it's just going to fill you with great ideas and it's going to, it's, it's, it's a mobile university. So you're just driving around, you're putting good stuff in. You need to find your tribe. You have to, you have to find your community. You have to find that community that is going, that is doing this business and working this. Cause the fact is you're going to be at that barbecue uh, at, at like a family reunion, or you're going to be uh 4th of July or Thanksgiving, and you're going to be excited about wholesaling real estate and being a real estate investor. And you're going to be talking to your family and you're going to be talking to your friends and you're going to physically see their eyes gloss over. They're just going to go blue. They're going to have no idea what you're talking about. So you got to surround yourself with people that are a few steps ahead of you. You have to find your tribe. It's absolutely critical. And then you find your model. What is your model that you're going to follow? And then from there, the mindset, listen, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you better have that mindset ready. Nobody, external forces for your mindset are, are not going to be the thing that's going to make you a millionaire. You either have it or you don't. I'm just telling you right now, either your brain is wired to get to work and be of service to this community and to your marketplace, or it's not. And that's fine. But just make the decision fast so you don't waste a bunch of time. And if it is, just go bananas and talk to people. I can see why you're the rhino king. That's it. You're, That's the, it. you're the leader of the rhino tribe. Well, people go into the, all these mindset stuff. And you know, I mean, you've had all these incredible thought leaders on mindset, mindset, and all these other things. And, and it's great to, to, to put in. But if you, don't, if you don't believe that we're put on this planet to be of service to other people, then this is gonna, it's not going to work for you. Yeah, It's not going to work for you. So, I mean, go and, 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 and get those shots of dopamine from people that are putting out incredible things. But if it's not internal that you're going to go out there every single day and try to have a vision, of, and that's all a business is. A business is a vision that one person has of where they want to go financially and professionally. And then they get all a bunch of other people that are like, yeah, that's a great plan. Let's follow that. And that's all it is. And you got to go, you got to be the, the, the leader of that. You got to go out there and you got to build the skills and you got to be the magnet to bring on cl a uh, class A people that are going to work with you. I love it. Brent Daniels, so, ladies and gentlemen. On. Come on, let's go. He is. You just know, like how, how, how fast did wholesaling change your life? Uh, oh, it was, it changed everything. Everything. One year. One year. Here, I mean, my story is, people have already heard it, but yeah. it, it took me over 14 months to get my first deal. Sure. But I didn't have a mentor until the last three, right. two or three. I was a dumbass. Yeah. I went out alone. I didn't have a community. I didn't have anything until I discovered the Jack Miller group, P. Fortunato and John Schaub and Lyle Wall and all these um, you know, uh, I forget the trust the guy who taught me about trust. It was all boring, by the way. I had the same experience as you. It was painful because I am not a math math guy. I'm not good with numbers. 
I love making money and counting money, but I'm not good at math naturally. And so they were very transactionally mm -hmm. engineering the math side of things. And it took me a long time to understand. But by getting plugged into that world and finally feeling comfortable and having people teach me things that I wasn't able to learn in books, hold me accountable, love on me, get, like you said, I have 3,000 investors in my phone. Mm -hmm. I was calling these people all the time, talking to them. It made a major difference. And, and once I had that, that was the secret. That was the game changer. Yeah. I got to deals quickly and way more consistently. Within one year of doing my first deal, I made my first, I became a millionaire. So it's like one, you become, you make 1.3 million on paper. Mm -hmm in a year, mm -hmm. your whole life changes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I bet you didn't have a huge personnel. You didn't have a ton of people. I don't have anything. Working, I didn't have anything. You. However, you know what you I did? You and a phone. Yeah. But you know what I did do? Uh. I spent it all. Yeah. Like a dumbass. Wow. <laughs> and that's a whole nother tax shit show story yeah. for another episode. I would, I would say, you know, to avoid that, I always tell people, listen, you close a big deal, you got $500 budget. Go buy a nice pen, go buy a nice meal, go buy shoes, go buy that, you know, whatever, that that bag you wanted or whatever it is. You got 500 bucks and then get back to work. Yep. You know what I mean? Because we go, oh, I'm going to go bananas. I'm yeah. going to go, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so- It's yeah. like everybody who comes into money too quick. That's it. This, this really is like a money faucet. Once you understand it, you can just turn it on. And the goal is getting the consistency yep. down. Um, I couldn't be more thankful for you coming into the studio and sharing sharing your wisdom, You're amazing. knowledge. How do yeah. people follow you, find you, get plugged into your tribe? Yeah, we, we put a lot of love and effort into our YouTube channel. So uh, just Brent Daniels on YouTube and then uh, Wholesaling Inc., Wholesaling Inc. podcast. And what days and do, you, do you do that? Every day. Every day we have a podcast. That's crazy. Uh, Monday through Friday. I got to set so, my podcast game up. Well, we interview... Listen, it, it's it's an interview. The 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 reason that Wholesaling Inc. has done a great job with the podcast is we interview uh, people that have done their first deals, people that have done uh, you know amazing things that that had no background in real estate, and so it makes it real for people that are just starting out. And obviously, we interviewed you. We interviewed like the top thought leaders in our industry, but um, most of it, the the nuts and bolts of it, is just interviewing people that just went out there. How'd you find your first deal? What was the list? What'd you say to them? What was the situation? How'd you negotiate it? Like we put them in the hot seat, mm. like prove it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Break down the deal. And so they do. And it, and, and it turns in, it, it's been, um, it's been amazing. I love that. Yeah. All right, cool. Make sure you guys go support and follow Brent. Uh, I have been on his podcast. It is fantastic. He's got a great studio, by the way, with LED mm -hmm. fancy walls and all kinds of cool stuff. So it's actually really enjoyable to watch. You learn a ton. Yeah. And uh, he's got a lot of great resources over over there for his community members as well. All right, you know the drill. Uh, make sure you subscribe to this episode into this podcast and uh, share it with a friend if you got some value from it. Uh, AIRealEstateSystem.com, I think, was the website I shared for the uh, the CRM that has the AI and the built-in marketing tools and. Uh, all that other good stuff. You also get the scripts and the contracts and everything uh, with that. So go check that out. Until next time, we're out of here. Take care, comb your hair. Peace. Hey, Cody Sperber, the original Clever Investor, host of the Clever Investor Show podcast. And I'm shooting this ad right now to let you know that this podcast exists. It's finally out and we have some amazing guests. So please, I'm begging you, can you just come and give our podcast a listen? I've been doing real estate for a really long time. I've accessed some of the coolest people in the world. We were having all these amazing conversations and I'm like, what are we doing? Let's record this and actually put it out on a podcast. But the problem is I have to let people know about it. That's where this ad comes in and this is where you come in. You're going to be able to learn from successful entrepreneurs, get in-depth interviews from amazing leading experts. You're going to learn real estate investing strategies and tactical training strategies that work in today's market. We're going over market analysis and different market predictions. You're going to be able to engage in an awesome community. And we go into some pretty deep dives on the mindset of what it takes to win the game of money and in life, plus lots of bonus resources and exclusive content. So what you're going to want to do right now is click the link that you see on your screen and give the show a subscribe today. We have amazing guests like Ken McElroy and Robert Kiyosaki and Wes Watson and Pace Morby and Jamil Damji and Vina Jetty and a whole host of amazing men and women entrepreneurs that you're going to love to learn from and get to know. So what you want to do right now is click that link and give the show a subscribe today.